Uh, this is somebody who's been a major part of the show. You know her from multiple things, and you love her from multiple things. She's one of the most impressive hosts, news anchors, analysts in the game. It's awesome to work with her. Alona Minkowski, everybody. Yeah. told me that you wanted to workshop a new uh, Klobuchar impression. Oh. <laughs> I, I think you guys have all learned over the years I have no skills when it comes to the impression. No, that's actually not true. Except I don't my remember Adiana. what name. It was my Ariana Huffington. That was, you know. oh, yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. I remember the Ariana Huffington one. I was like, I looked at acupuncture. <laughs> Benefits? No. 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 <laughs> Zero, Johnny, no benefit. What was her thing? Was, uh, sleeping. It's about work life balance, getting more sleep, keeping your phone in the other room when you sleep, which none of her employees really get to do. <laughs> Did she, I mean, I know there's an NDA. But, uh, was she conducive of people getting sleep? Uh, you know, I never really worked that closely with her. Probably. That shrewd Russian shit. Alona was just like, I am not going to work with that. I'm going to say the inner circle didn't get a lot of sleep. So you were out, like, on the ground in 2016. And we've talked about this. Because so much of what's going on is a press failure story. And there is the big picture. Like, there is the Noam Chomsky manufacturing consent. There are limited lines of ideological debate allowed. And You've covered that from the very beginning of your career, particularly on foreign policy, military, industrial complex. But what you're seeing now, specifically around Bernie, is just a complete like meltdown because the artifice is breaking. And you already saw that in 2016. Yeah, I, I mean, 2016 was a really incredible experience for me because I was on the road all year long. Every week I was in a new state, and it's intense and it's tiring, but also so eye-opening. I got to see a lot of the country that I had never seen before, and that's how you really get, you know, a pulse for the mood of the nation and, and what voters are thinking and feeling, and and uh, you know what their priorities are. And one thing that I really noticed there was a significant difference between the way we did our coverage at HuffPost and the way everyone else did our their coverage is that you know we'd go into a state, we'd go to a couple rallies or events that were put on by campaigns, but then we also went out and did other stories that actually, you know, reflected what was happening in those specific communities that we were in. And so I just noticed that, you know, when you have a lot of um, reporters that are just embedded with the campaign, they're on the bus all the time, they only go to these rallies, and then at the rallies, they're in like the press pen or they're up on these bleachers, you're not even mingling with anybody. If you do talk to any real people, they're already the uber politically you know, excited type of people because they're at a political rally. And so, of course, you're out of touch. Um, you know, and that's something that, I don't know if you ever listen to the Daily, Daily the New York Times podcast. But I do not, Alona. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not shocking, not shocking. Yeah. Uh, but Michael Barber recently had Dean McKay on to do like a post-mortem of 2016 and kind of where the New York Times is now compared to 2016 and the election coverage. Even more embarrassing. <laughs> My editorial, no. You know what, I'll give him a little credit for at least broaching the topic and at least having the no, honestly, on. I'm not trying, like, if it was actually so, do you know what I'm saying? I feel like there's a lot of like, Hey, let's analyze ourselves. Oh, you know what? We could well, really I was getting to the part of where they didn't analyze right, themselves. Okay. Give me a minute. All right, sorry. I sorry, Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so there was almost no acknowledgement by Dean McKay that they, you know, went too hard for Hillary, hired a reporter about the Clintons before Hillary Clinton even said she was going to be a candidate. 
um, and started writing a lot of lines about her being the nominee long before she was the actual nominee. And his excuse was kind of like, yeah, if I could go back, you know, there's a, there's a lot of edits I'd make. <laughs> and I was like, well, it didn't really work that way. Uh, but then he made the point that they weren't out in the country enough, and that's why they misread Donald Trump's victory so much. <laughs> and, um, and I, are you, everybody all right? Everybody okay? I thought you were falling over because that was so funny. <laughs> everybody all right? Okay. Yep. Um, and yeah, no shit. He didn't go out in the country enough, and so that's, you know, the real problem with what we're seeing with, with Bernie right now, too, is that it's like not a dirty secret. Um, but it is a dirty secret that there is no such thing as a liberal media, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, right. the media, as we know it, the mainstream, the establishment media is centrist, is moderate, and that's just kind of the norm, that's the status quo, and there are massive assumptions that are made based on everyone just being in the center. Um, and even like the how wrong that perception of the center is. Like, you can find many people in the country who are going to be more like on the right on social issues and are hate banks. Like, I will say, and I'm, I'm getting some flack for this, and I whatever. You know, I don't even need to do the qualifier. James Carville is James Carville, but he's the only person that they allow on television who's like fear mongering about Bernie about things that might actually be a problem for him, and still saying like. He said today, like, Bernie's talking about felons voting. That's going to be a fucking disaster. And then in the next graph, he actually is like, why has nobody put out an ad of Donald Trump and Davos saying you need to cut Medicare? Like, what the fuck is going on? Which is 100% right. And he's the only person that they allow on television, I think, that has, or not the only, but one of the only, that is, like, slightly in line with that. Everybody else is just like, you know, I got to tell you, people in the middle of the country are just so thirsty to give rich people tax cuts and cut their social security. I don't think Bernie gets that. There's all these assumptions that are made like, well, we need a moderate candidate if they're really gonna win. Says who? It's like, says what historical... Woo! When's the last time we had a real left candidate who was the Democratic nominee who lost an election? You know, we haven't, because we haven't had a real left uh, candidate. So, who was the nominee? So, you know, it's things like that. Or, or you watch any of the debates. I don't know what's happening at the debate tonight, but... Yeah, what time? I don't know what time the debate tonight is. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, it's on now. You people are shams. <laughs> yeah, you're in the right What place. do you want to watch that shit for anyway? Bernie won it. Woo! Bernie won it. Let me guess. Amy Klobuchar was like, people are forgetting that I win. Stay wide. And actually, when I... Put my staffer's face in the toilet. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> and one liners like, though. What'd you say? For little one For one liners. Rehearses like twenty times and looks in the mirror. I'd like to see how his hair looks. In the <laughs> and then Warren's like, Yo, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's why I'm here. Here's why I'm pumping everything up. Here's the thing. I'm a narcissistic desire to be the president. Here's the thing. And then Pete will be like, you know, I don't know where you come from, but where I come from, CIA training school. <laughs> Regularly disregard the popular vote all the time. You guys watch the debate, that's it. Got it. You didn't have to go there. <laughs> but just think about it, at the debates, you will have the moderators be asking really serious questions over and over and over again if we're talking about healthcare, Medicare for all, for example, about how are you going to pay for this? And that'll come after a 30-minute segment on foreign policy, you know, where we're like, well, will you meet with this world leader? And how are you going to confront Iran? Yada, yada, yada. And then no one ever asks, how are you going to keep paying for the largest military budget in the world? And so that's what I mean by like, the liberal media by no means is, you know, it is liberal. That's the mindset and that's the approach that they always take. And you've been trying, like, you've been working in media to try to push on that for a very long time. And I guess, like, outside of all the institutional reasons, we know why that's the case. What is up with, like, the culture of people who go into media that affects that? <laughs> What's wrong with us? Um, I mean, and I never really have worked in, you know, a, a, like, I guess HuffPost is, is kind of a mainstream organization, but... 
you know, I've been kept out of all the networks, my <laughs> dirty past working for RT. Um, I think that there's a lot of groupthink that goes on, and, and people don't want to acknowledge it, they don't see it maybe, because you just become part of this machine, especially when there's a news cycle that's moving really quickly all the time, and you think like, well, they're covering it, so we gotta cover the same thing, and so no one ever steps outside of it. You just kind of start rolling with the flow, and so then you don't want to be the, the person that's getting ridiculed, uh, you know, for daring to take a different approach or having a different point of view on a story. So I don't know, I guess it's just not a lot of critical, unique thinkers are the, are the ones who... Uh, they're all a bunch of nerds. No, I mean, there are great reporters out there, but it also might not be what they're being assigned or what you know, their editors are telling them is going to be able to make the cut to be a story or... Well, that's, that's another thing, too, that especially after 2016, there was like this big phenomenon of like parachute reporters. Where you send somebody who's been in New York City or DC their whole life and you send them to Alabama. And like as a southerner, I always crack up when I read these like in-depth reports on the South because they always start the same way. They either start out in a piggly wiggly, or with some line like the air was as thick as me mosh, chicken and dumplings. <laughs> but it's really bad because the kind of the way that they portray these regions of the country really matters. And the way that the New York Times and a lot of these national publications report in the South. It would be, people don't realize that that's the most diverse part of the country, that has one of the largest LGBTQ part, parts of the country, and these people are completely glossed over because of their fixation of finding this mythical, you know, hillbilly Trump voter to interview. And it's a big problem. Yeah. I mean, the obsession with, like, understanding the Trump voter after 2016, <laughs> when everyone was trying to do a post-mortem. Haven't we learned so much from all those experiments? <laughs> no, those I also like, find funny is, profile. like, just even geographically, like, you could just go to, like, upstate New York. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? I'm from North Dakota, it's the exact same thing. It doesn't require, like, you literally could just go a couple hours out of New York City, and you, you go to parts of Long Island and see it. 